Hello and welcome to another episode of Knife Making Tuesday. And this week, we're going to be working with Tormac's new lathe. My new toy, my baby, my precious. Loving this lathe. We are going to be making spacers. Focus. So we use these spacers on the knives to attach the handles together. There's one and there's another one. I've made these several different ways in the past and I'm always trying to find the best, easiest, most accurate way to do it. One of the first ways that I did that I made them and I made them for I, like quite a while this way and I've got a clip of that is I used to buy them in sheet form and use my milling machine to mill the I could do like 96 at a time or something like that. Mill them standing up so I drill them and tap them and then mill the top and mill the little groove there and then flip the whole sheet over and then mill the other side and cut them all out. And it worked okay, but this part has a shoulder on either side. And the accuracy of that shoulder is very important. So when I would flip it from one side to the other on the fixture, not all of them were concentric on the two shoulders. And that led to the knife handles being just a little bit crooked and the blades being a little bit off center on several knives. So I didn't really like doing it that way. But now that I have my own lathe, we can uh, make them ourselves and I'm really excited to get these going because I'm gonna make them perfectly unlike the last shop that made them for me. Once I started getting sick of doing them in sheet form I sought out uh, having a machine shop make them for me because I didn't have a good lathe yet and uh, I needed them perfect and I needed them now so I felt around and I, I looked for a couple different shops and I got quotes from a lot of people and then I ended up choosing this one shop that uh, had them back to me within two weeks, which was amazing. And they worked for a little while, and then the closer I used them, and the closer I started looking at them and measuring them, I started to realize quite a big variance between all the parts. Like, I ordered 200 spacers, which is enough for 100 knives. Consistency was very poor. Quality was... The, the choice of machining code that they used is not what I wanted. And I thought I made that clear, but obviously I didn't which led to problems, uh, slight problems with the knives. I mean, you guys aren't ever going to see them as customers, but as guys assembling them, it was difficult and annoying, and I had to, like, put weird stuff here and there, and it was annoying. Now that I can make them myself, I will do them exactly how I want to do them. So there were a whole bunch that they sent me um, that were too big, too, too big of a tolerance to fit where I needed them to fit, and they're useless to me. Price-wise, if you're looking to get stuff like this, made yourselves. Um, the price quotes I got were anywhere from pretty much three to five dollars per part, which at first seemed like a lot, and I, I shied away from having them made for a long time because that's kind of a lot of money, especially when you're talking about buying 200 or something. However, if you can find the shop to make them very well, or at least to your specifications, then you just have to eat the price of um, three to five dollars each and you have the part that you want. I've had this for a few weeks now and I've been playing with it. Um, the first series of parts that I made were these uh, lock bar stabilizers. I made 50 of these guys. They turned out so nice. So basically it is a teeny tiny little screw, if I can get you to focus. 440 threads, really short. And then on, on the mill I flipped it over and I milled a um, Torx pattern into it and did a little engraving and stuff. I didn't actually do a lot of filming while making these. Next round of ones that I make, maybe I'll film the whole process. I was just sort of getting the feel for the lathe and tolerances and accuracy and all that stuff. But I tell you, all 50 that I made were within a few tenths of tolerance without even really trying or much experience on running the lathe. So I'm really happy with that. What I want to do, I want to, on video, go through the process of choosing all the tools that I need and setting up the, the lathe. I almost said mill. I'm setting up the lathe, uh, writing the code, because I'm going to be writing the code for this pretty much all by hand or also using the um, wizards that the lathe comes with on the control software and then running it. So hopefully it's not going to be like an hour long video, but I know some of you guys appreciate that. Yeah, it's going to be the whole process of kind of start to finish. This is my method of doing it. And as I said, I've only had it for a few weeks. If you see anything I'm doing glaringly wrong, you know, please share and be nice and help me, help me learn. Okay, let's get to it.
All right, to drill a hole through the spacer, I'm going to be using a 0.1015 drill bit, which is a number 38 drill bit. These are cobalt screw machines, so the short ones. Because these are what I used when I used to uh, drill the, the sheets of spacers. And I have all the speeds and feeds, and it just works. Um, so I'm using such a big bit because I'm going to be using a form tap. It's an OSG uh, 440 tap. Form taps are really sweet because they don't have cutting flutes. They just squish the material away. And like here's a form tap on the left versus a cut tap on the right. And the form taps are just a lot stronger and less resistant to breakage when they're this small. This cut tap actually was twice as long, but it broke off and then I just kind of ground the tip off by hand and it works fine now. So yeah, I'm going to be using a form tap. All right, well, Eric's using the blowtorch in the corner. The third uh, sort of drilling tool that I'm going to be using is a sp spotting tool. It looks like a drill bit, but it's not really a drill bit. It's, it's meant for spotting. Uh, this is from YG. Um, I got this from Tormac. It just says CO, so it is cobalt. Um, so basically, I'm going to have three stations here. Uh, spot the hole, drill the hole, and then rigid tap the hole. So that's going to be cool. And then some various turning tools as well, and parting off tools and grooving tools. So I'm not quite sure how many tools total I'm going to need, but this is, this is part of it anyway. So I'm using Tormax uh, ER16 TTS holders, which look really pretty when they're brand new. I've never used ER16. For the mill, I only use ER20. So they're kind of dainty and cute. So for the spotting tool, it's a quarter inch. So I use a quarter inch collet. Stick it into here first. And like so. So I was putting this together trying to figure out why the drill bit didn't go any farther than that. Mm -hmm. And turns out there is a backstop in there. So if I use a three millimeter Allen key, I can take it out or move it down or whatever I need to do. See, now it goes all the way through. I don't know what the through diameter is, it's not quarter, but just for fun, which is kind of good, because if the drill bit sees a lot of pushing force, it doesn't look like that goes any deeper. Yeah, kind of makes sense lengthwise. So while Eric is once again heat anodizing the set of handles, we are going to talk about the collet closer. So this is the collets, they're regular old 5C collets, I get the set from Tormac, and this is a collet closer with the push of the drawbar lever here, it pulls the collet closed. Your workpiece holds in here, so you can hold whatever. And when the collet's loose, it slips right in. But when it pulls the, when you pull this, tightens it up, keeps it nice and tight. So this makes going from part to part, you slap this forward, your rod can slip, slide forward, and then tighten it again. I'm gonna undo it, because I have a different collet to put in. Pretty simple, you find the little thingy here, and then this big knurled ring right here, unscrew that. goes. Collar comes out the front, new one goes in. Easy peasy. Okay, I've got it in, I've got it adjusted. This screw attachment here also lets you adjust the tension and the tightness that it pulls closed at. And it's pretty simple how it works. Um, you can see these little cam clamps when they go up this, this ramp right here. There's three of them. And either these are spring tensioned so that they deflect and provide the spring tension, or there's some other spring in there somewhere. But that's what keeps the collet closed. And it rides up on the ramp. So if I if I back this off a little bit, then this becomes super easy. But I want it just tight enough so that I have to really crank on it. Because otherwise the collet can slip a little bit. Here's the other end. So yeah, when it's loose, it comes right out. Anyway, simple. Uh, I've got a question for all you guys with similar collet setups. I know some of you guys like uh, Tactical Keychains Brad. You've got not a um, collet closer like this, but a pneumatic one. So it's got a little air cylinder in the back. 
that opens up the collet and then you've got a bar puller on the gang tools here that comes in and grabs the part and pulls it out and eventually that's what I want to set up to, to let it be op uh, automatic operation. However, I notice with my collets the bar is, is really hard to pull through. Like I can't I can't quite pull it with my fingers but I can push it from the other end. It's still difficult though. <clears throat> I'm just wondering if that's common. If that's common or if my collets are tight or something. Because I don't know how much grip the bar puller actually puts on these rods. Uh, sometimes it looks like not very much at all. Yeah, I was just curious about that. Well, I think I just answered my own question. One of the new toys that I bought recently is a, a digital micrometer that reads in half tenth increments, which is crazy small. I got this from Shars. I like and I don't like ordering from them um, because they have a lot. They have a vast selection of tools for very cheap, affordable prices. They're all I don't want to say lower end stuff, but it's certainly not higher end stuff. However, the prices are phenomenal. I got this for I think forty five dollars. It reads to half tenth increments, and part of me doesn't really care if zero point two five oh 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 is exactly zero point two five oh 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 because I may mostly need it for just comparison purposes. So I'm comparing two parts to make sure they're the same, or comparing a run of parts to make sure that they're all the same. Whether or not it's reading exactly what it's supposed to be that the $300 version might do, um, I don't really care. And for $45, I couldn't turn it down. I, I, I needed to get one so I can try it and see if I love it, and then if I need more accuracy, then I can get a Mitutoyu or whatever um, brand would be awesome. So anyway, the tightness, I put in this spot drill which slides in very freely and very easily. And this guy measures 2491. So instead of 250, which would be quarter, this measures uh, just under, so 9 tenths smaller, just under 1,000 smaller than quarter inch. Whereas this guy is about the opposite. I think it's 2508, so it's 8 tenths, 7 tenths higher than quarter inch, which makes them, what, maybe a thou and a half, makes the titanium bar a thou and a half thicker than the other one. So this is oversized by just a hair, um, and I'm sure different rods come in different tolerances, and some are going to be over and some are going to be under, and it's just a variance like that, so it might not be a big deal long term, or it'll change all the time, I guess. But anyway, I put this guy in because I think I'm going to try to shorten it on the lathe and see if I can destroy some carbide by trying to part uh, half an inch off of this because my two my drill bit and my tap ended up being the exact same height and for gang tools You kind of want them all to be the same height and having this guy stick way the heck out there would not work And maybe I'll show you why right now So this is a gang tool lathe or gang style gang of style whatever you want to call it So instead of having a big turret tool changer that changes from one tool to the next this just lets you slide the table to a different position so if the workpiece is right in the center here, I would spot it and then move up and drill it and then move up and tap it and now you can start to see why you want the tools to be the same length because if I spot it here and then I go to drill it you can see that the spotting tool is hitting the top and depending on how far out my workpiece sits the spotting tool might totally interfere and run into the spindle and cause problems whereas if they're all on the same plane then it probably would work very well so I'm gonna to try to shorten it um, I'm sure you can buy shorter ones but let's have fun and see if we can part this off so to part it off, I got this tool from Shars as well. I got quite a few different selection of tools from Shars because they're cheap and they're all different styles and they'll let me sort of test everything and fine tune what style of tool that I like to use the best. And then from there, if I want to upgrade to Iskar, or Sandvik or big brand name ones, I can instead of just blowing all kinds of money on random tooling that I don't know if I'm going to need yet. So Shars is excellent for that and the quality is very good. I don't know if the inserts are going to be super high quality, but they're cheap. And as a learner, you know, I got this 10-pack for, they're like $3 each or something. Whereas a brand name would be $12 each, or something like that. For learning tools, you, you gotta be able to afford to break stuff. I can afford to break shard stuff. <laughs> Alright, so this, this spotting tool that I'm trying to uh, shorten a little bit, I thought I would try the shards tool first with this insert and see if I could uh, part it off. Now this is like tool steel, so it's, it's really tough stuff. It's not just regular old soft steel. And it didn't work so well, because I had this mounted upside down, but basically what happens is this little section right here is taking all the force, and it bent. Um, obviously not enough to, to deform it, but it bent out of the way, and then the insert just fell out, and the insert uh, got pretty dull pretty quick, cutting that hardened steel. And I could see the whole thing kind of flexing. This is not the most rigid sort of scenario for doing that kind of stuff. So this tool would work for light cuts, not for heavy cuts, because it's just so weak. 
So then what I ended up trying is I had a uh, CCMT diamond shaped insert already in that first boring bar and I thought I would just turn it down which is when you go sideways like that. And so far it's working great so let's film some of that. So I've already used that insert to make my LBS screws, um, so it's maybe a little bit worn down, so I, I don't care if I destroy it turning this down. So without even thinking about it, I'm just going to try 1000 RPM and then use the jog wheel to move it manually. So I'll go down a little bit, and then over. Pretty big cut here. You can see it's starting to go tapered and heat up. So at some point here, it's not gonna end well. Now you can see it bending. Watch the screen. <laughs> That's about the limits there. And as it's heating up, it's probably hardening weird, so. I'll figure out a way to break that off. Maybe we'll just grind it off on the grinder. Much better. They're not exactly even. I could take more off of this, but I think that'll be plenty fine for now. I did end up destroying my uh, that last little insert there, trying to get that nub off. But it worked. Alright, so here is the gang tool setup that I was using for the uh, lock bar stabilizers. Just had four tools, but I'm, I realized through the process of making them that this is not the most efficient setup for tools, because with a gang tool, with a gang you want maximize the use of space and use of tools. And this comes with experience, and I watched, uh, you know, all of Tactical Keychain's videos, all of Will, uh, Tactile Turn. He has a lot of really good um, YouTube videos on gang style aids to make his pen. So I've just kind of guessed for this setup, but I'm going to change it around now, because you can see See my black line here and here, that's my travel. From the spindle center line, this table can move down so that that black line is here and then up. So that's sort of my area for tool usage. So when I set up the drills and everything for the uh, spacers that I'm making right now, I'll rearrange things and figure it all out. I should be able to get at least six tools, even on just one block. These riser blocks are six inches. You can see how it's all set up here. It's got a riser block and then your tool posts. So I've got two riser blocks, and two blocks spans, I think it's about 10 inches of travel, and the blocks are 6 inches, so I can't quite get two blocks full of tools, but I get my drills, and if I took this post off and put the drills right there, you can see how I can get six, six tools right there. So I'll do that. 